Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you to Deidre and Carla for organizing this conference, and thank you. I'm grateful for the invitation to speak. Although I don't really work on Wooster's photos, hopefully I can provide a broader context to look at his kind of scopic archive. Um, so the, the title of my paper, as Deidre said, is the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, Bioeconomies, and Archival Bodies in Philippine History. I'm not sure I like, I'm in love with the subtitle anymore. I'm thinking more like an intellectual history of debt, like financial debt. Um, so I'll just start. So Dean C. Wooster's epistemological legacy, as well as the University of Michigan's fraught colonial history in the Philippines, are important structural moments in Filipino history. They are difficult to disentangle from Filipino nationalist historiography and subjectivity. While the visual economy embodied in representations of the native Filipino body in Wooster's graphic archive are vital instances of American projects of racial uplift and scientific knowledge production, I focus here on other aspects of Wooster's epistemic legacy that frame the parameters of my critique. Wooster as an historical and intellectual figure is certainly relevant to the project I present here, but is also evocative of a multi-sided and multifaceted articulation of Filipino raciality, Filipino-American intellectual history, and developments in political and archival economies. His particular investment in the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, which began initially as the Ethnological Survey of the Philippines, of which his scopic politics are certainly a part, takes center stage in a complex historical portrait of the confluence confluence of the sciences, Filipino race imaginaries, and economic processes in Mindanao, one of the principal sites of my historical inquiry. This project represents an imaginative, albeit vexatious, historical shuttling between contemporary representations on, of Filipino epistemic sovereignty and historical economic deployments of race in Muslim Mindanao, emanating from Wooster's Bureau. I attempt to read historical developments in Philippine political economy and agribusiness investment in Davao along the grain of epistemological developments in Filipino racial imagination and contemporary critiques of neoliberalism. It's very American studies in that way. So some canonical readings of Philippine history have narrativized the Filipino subject as a liberal, masculinist, intellectual, fluent in the various, various, various languages of European Enlightenment thought. Russell B. Mohades' Brains of the Nation maps a critical genealogy of what he terms the Filipino Enlightenment, organized into biographical chapters of a male-centered mestizo vision of Philippine anti-coloniality. The critical work in Philippine intellectual history has illustrated that late 19th century bourgeois elite, like Pedro Paterno, Jose Rizal, and Isabelo de Reyes, disturbed the epistemic sovereign uh, hegemony that Europe exercised over regimes of knowledge production. The work of these luminaries has been recuperated, rehearsed, and consolidated historiographically into a canon of Filipino intellectual th thought, highlighting the epistemic and national sovereignty of the Philippines. However, Filipino intellectual work of the modern era, era so late 19th, early 20th centuries, also introduced tropes and themes into Philippine cultural and nationalist imagination that actively shape Filipino racial, gender, and sexual identities. Doris Summer argues that normative fiction becomes anodyne during and after periods of internecine conflict, postulating, quote, the, norm the domestic romance as an exhortation to be fruitful and multiply, wedding the continued existence of the nation to normative ideals of marriage, private property, the nuclear family, and heteromonogamy. The normative impulse of the modern romance, or romantic nationalism, also establishes hierarchies and disciplinary technologies of surveillance that excise the non-normative from the national imaginary, recasting it as unpatriotic, anarchistic, destructive, and even colonial itself. The texts of Filipino epistemic sovereignty have actively formed a heteronormative foundational fiction wherein heterosexual, patriarchal, and mestizo desire becomes constitutive of the Philippine nation state. So this project takes as its starting point the collusion of Filipino national epistemology with neoliberal capitalist exploitation, which some Filipino advocacy organizations have already critiqued in the context of a heavily feminized international migrant labor pool. Uh, Artist Revolution is an advocacy group that organized against perceived political apathy and governmental corruption leading up to the 2010 Philippine presidential elections that saw Benigno Aquino III elected to office. The administration of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo was fraught with corruption, scandal, and violence, equaling and, uh, by some estimates, even surpassing the Marcos dictatorship. Sensing similar political convulsions that characterized Batas Militar, Artist Revolution sought to, quote, break the hold of apathy, cynicism, and hopelessness that seemed so entrenched in our country. Juana Change was a popular and important figure in the cultural and critical expression of the group's politics. 
While many comedic political videos featuring Wanna Chains were published and continue to be published by the group, I focus my attention on one particularly salient one that bridges the epistemological and economic and represents the type of critique I hope to replicate in my own historical research and indeed anchors the perhaps peripatetic historical shadowing that this project evokes. So right now I'll actually play you a Wanna Change video and I promise it does have something to do with Mindanao. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have seen this video called Bayani, so I'll just play the whole thing. If it will load. Oh. How do I do the sound? Do you want to pause it for a minute? Yeah, yeah, not a problem. We'll just sit tight. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know if the sound's on. No one heard anything, right? No. Okay. It is, yeah. Sorry, guys. Okay, maybe I'll just continue, and if we get the sound spooled, then we'll go back, maybe. Okay. <coughs> oh. Okay. All right. So, the video is titled Bayani, meaning hero in Tagalog, and a word sloganized by the Philippine Human Expert Economy when referring to the profound monetary contributions of overseas Filipino workers, OFWs, to the Filipino economy. The video features Juana Change, uh, portrayed by May Painter, as an OFW who works as a domestic helper in Rome. She's on a return flight to Italy, having just visit her, visited her family. Juan is conversing with her seatmate, who remains unseen for the majority of the video. She comically and critically talks about her experience as co a contract labor for the Philippine expert economy. At the end of the video, she remarks on the uncanny familiarity of her interlocutor, who turns out to be Jose Rizal, wreathed in divine light, with the nole in hand. The video ends with a translated quote from Bertolt Brecht that reads, Kawawang bayang walang bayani, pero mas kawawang bayang nangangalang panang bayani, which translates roughly to deprived is the nation without heroes, but even more deprived is the nation that is still unneeded them. The video is meant to critique the continued dependence of the Philippines on the remittances that OFWs invest in the domestic economy and the contradictory and insulting discourse that labels their efforts heroic. To be clear, I do not seek to minimize their effort and material contributions to the Filipino and global economy. Rather, I seek to destabilize the elegizing rhetoric that does little to critique the economic inequalities that maintain Filipinas' continued precarious servitude in global economy, a critique that the video imparts. Importantly, for my purposes, the video draws a materialist transhistorical connection between the plights of the Filipino migrant laborer and the epistemological idealism represented by the Filipino Pampansang Bayani ng Pilipinas, or Jose Rizal. I am positioned the important political critique that Juana Change poses to neoliberal logics of accumulation to offer an alternative historical and theoretical optic to highlight the political stakes of understanding the context zone of Philippine anti-colonial and post-colonial epistemologies. Ultimately, it becomes increasingly difficult to disaggregate the epistemic utopia of the Filipino Enlightenment from the historical deployments of gender discourses of scientific raciality and masculinist apotheosis. 
This modern critique of the utopian affect of La Ilustración Filipina, or the Filipino Enlightenment, given our neoliberal imperialist contemporary moment, also invites more thorough analyses of historical developments in political economy of the Philippine state as these developments were managed by scientific discourses of race, or gendered scientific discourses of race. It has already been argued by Ray Leto that science was a discourse that positioned Filipino men in positions of power in the burgeoning Philippine state. It was also the racial imaginaries produced by American scientific discourse that positioned various actors in political economy during U.S. occupation of the Philippines. Racial power that was secured not only through strate strategic deployments of scientific discourse, but also embedded in paradigms of what current analytics would label settler colonialism. I argue that anthropological discourse that saw the founding of the ethnological survey of Filipino peoples into racial hierarchies and its later governmental iteration as the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes colluded with technologies of settler colonialism to scaffold imperial capitalist penetration of the southern Philippines, Mindanao. These manifold collusions demonstrate that the multiracial and hierarchized imaginaries of Philippine bodies were cleaved by discourses of indigeneity and civilization. American Indian scholars like Jody Byrd attempt to reposition indigeneity not as a discursive problem that Western legal thought has had to overcome, but rather as performative repetitions of indigenous displacement through racialized, gendered, ableist, and sexualized processes of dispossession, constituting a radical alterity. And that's her quote. So that is, Indianness for Byrd is a transit that allows, quote, U.S. empire to orient and replicate itself by transforming those to be colonized into Indians through continual reiterations of pioneer logics, whether in the Pacific, the Caribbean, the Middle East, or the Middle East. The familiarity of Indianness is salve for the liberal multiculturalist democracy within the settler societies that serve as empire's constituency, end quote. Regrettably, the Philippines represents one of these constituencies historically and its collusion with the U.S. empire. Settler colonial paradigms that pervade Filipino racial and gender imaginaries that take root in the modern co colonial choreographies of the early Philippine Commonwealth enable contemporary and historical logics of accumulation by dispossession, logics that continually embed and invisibilize themselves on the <coughs> Filipina, the non-normative, and the indigenous, non-Christian Muslim laboring body. We have sound. Well, do you want to see the video? Yeah? Okay. Let me see. Oh, did I exit out? Oh, okay. So keep my reading in mind, I guess, while it plays. Or no? Well, up by. Thank you. No subtitles. Sorry, I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Ah, here we go. Okay. I imagine we want subtitles so we can understand. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm sorry. <laughs> What's the rewatch? Hi. I won't touch any of them. <laughs> I'm the worst at YouTube videos right now. I'm so sorry. Hello. 
Ano mo sinuwerte ako sa employee eh. Na gusto ko yung sigaw ko na nanginginig sa taba. Nako! Tawal pa ngayon. Ah. Hi! <laughs> Maybe this wasn't meant to be, guys. <laughs> okay, I'll just let it spool. And then... I think you're right. I think it's still downloading. Okay, we'll just let it do its thing, and I'll just read. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for taking this ride with me. <laughs> All right, um, I also theorize that it was the financial introduction of debt, rhetorics of benevolence, and the corresponding moral affect of indebtedness that positioned originally scientific and objective institutions like the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes as agents of bioeconomy, whose anthropological category, categories identified indigenous non-Christian Filipino bodies as capable and expendable laborers in Philippine political economy. Drawing on Denise de Silva's work on the historical deployments of the analytics of raciality, I suggest that it is a colonialist trick of bioeconomy that rhetorically defers the ethical problems of capitalist exploitation of moro and indigenous labor by labeling these bodies as perpetually indebted to the state for their progress in civilization. I seek to intervene in research on affects of benevolent assimilation to understand that in capitalist systems of political economy, the byproduct of imperial benevolence is moral indebtedness to a settler colonial formation. It should then come as no surprise that the primary agent of racialized scientific discourses of civilization in the Philippines, uh, the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, also functioned as a financial institution that facilitated capitalist development in the southern Philippines and as a debt collector of actual monetary debts to the state from non-Christian laborers in Manila-sponsored agribusiness regimes. So the early years of the Philippine Commonwealth actually saw the preservation of the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes and its increased role in economic development of the transnational capitalist region of Davao. Indeed, the, agri agri uh, the agribusiness plantation style cultivation of copra, hemp, rubber, lumber, and coconut became increasingly important for the performance of the Philippine economy as it transitioned into Commonwealth status. And of course, investments in Davao were not limited to Philippine firms, but also many U.S. and Japanese sponsored agri-colonies, which shipped to, quote, the U.S., Japan, U.K., Canada, Holland, Spain, Australia, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, Norway, Sweden, France, Hong Kong, you get the idea. So it was a transnational hub. Uh, the Commonwealth was also invested in the discursive authority that it exercised in the region through dispossessive practices of eminent domain, wherein the Philippine government owed owned and seized lands originally occupied by those other pagan and Muslim Filipinos, namely the Bagobo and the Tagakaolo. Sorry if I mispronounced those. Furthermore, the transnational commercial agri-colonies became increasingly reliant on indigenous Filipino labor. And indigenous is always in scare quotes because you never know how it translates to different contexts. The division of labor between what could be called a settler state and, a plantation, and plantation laborers is suggestive of regimes of economic and scientific racism that pervaded and perhaps still pervades Filipino racial imaginaries, especially given that the Bureau was one of the principal institutions involved in the capitalist penetration of Mindanao. So uh, reports 1934 to 1935 of the director of the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes uh, provide a unique look into the function of the Bureau in economic life of the Philippine Islands. One report, dated uh, March 11, 1935, provides detailed accounts of development in the indigenous and Muslim South, describing progress in areas such as economy, education, and infrastructure. The goal of the report is plainly stated as part of, quote, efforts to advertise the natural resources of the provinces under the Bureau's ju jurisdiction, end quote, and to encourage goodwill between Christian and non-Christian Filipinos, quote, to look after the welfare of non-Christians whose main problem is to induce them to give up their nomadic mode of living, end quote, in favor of sta stationary plantation labor. The goal of the Bureau to foster the advancement and progress towards civilization of non-Christian indigenous Filipinos located discursively outside the Philippine nation, but within its jurisdiction, appears preserved during the beginning stages of Commonwealth, the, with the date of the reports literally we weeks leading up to um, the tidings McDuffie Act. The report sets the stage for a new deal, and this is a quote, for the Moros, also a quote, as recommended by then uh, Governor General Frank Murphy, which prescribed the es establishment of the Moros in the Philippine Commonwealth under conditions that will make them willing, patriotic, useful members of the body politic. 
the ultimate unification of the Christian Mohammedan P Filipino being the goal of our policy. The Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes was deeply invested in advancing civilization of Muslim Mindanao and other indigenous groups identified under the rubrics of scientific race spearheaded by figures like Wooster. We can observe in annual reports of the Bureau that the institution that began as an ethnological survey morphed into an institution that postulated projects of racial uplift via capitalist agricolonization and cosmopolitan discourses of civilizational uplift. Quote, the peaceful penetration of new settlers due to industrialization, their diligent industry, and their conduct had a great influence on the Mohammedan and pagans of Mindanao Sulu, and the latter's attitude toward the, their neighbors and toward the government. It is an attitude changed from hostility to friendliness and appreciation of the benevolent intentions of the government and the feeling of brotherhood on the part of their Christian Filipino neighbors. This has been a great factor in the solution of the so-called Moro problem. However, the reports remark upon the continued tensions between Mohammedans and Christian Filipinos due to the dispossession of indigenous lands. In an effort to norm non-Christian Filipinos to be productive citizens in the material development of the country, continued agribusiness investment and plantation economics remain vitally necessary to further the agricultural, industrial, and social development of the non-Christian inhabitants of the Philippine Islands and their progress in civilization. Thank you. Um, and the moral, material, economic, and social, economic, social, and political development of these regions. These are indeed rhetorics reminiscent of the benevolent assimilationist projects instituted by United States imperialism, um, and in fact continuing as this was a kind of a binational institution at the time um, in the Philippines and are rehearsed by the Commonwealth of the Philippine Republic. It seems plausible to theorize that the settler colonialist logics that undergirded the founding of the U.S. nation state are reflected in later economic policies wherein the separations in Filipino racial identity, Christian and non-Christian, pagan, non-pagan Filipino, are set into sharper relief. Indeed, because it is the Ethnological Survey of the Philippines, or the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, at this time, it appears that the logics of anthropological race are embedded deeply in developing Filipino political economy in the 20s and 30s. I would suggest that Philippine political economy is an epistemological context dependent on anthropological categories of the American race sciences to identify bodies through the lenses of paganism, indigeneity, and moral, um, as capable laborers in global economy, whose surplus value is partly a function of the indigenous dispossession of lands. And the further reimagination of Mindanaoans' relationship as Filipinos as extracted surplus value for the state. This supports neoliberal critiques and critical ethnic studies that suggest that difference is a modern capitalist formation deployed by the state to determine the value of particular bodies to capitalist modernity. Questions around dimensions of difference like race, gender, ability, and sexuality cannot and should not make sense outside of a historical analysis of a global division of human labor and intellectual capacities. Paula Chakravarty and Denise De Silva make this abundantly clear in their Race, Empire, and Crisis of the Subprime. They theorize how subprime debtor is a discursive racial signifier in this current crisis of capitalism, our crisis of capitalism. They argue that the subprime debtor is another racial iteration in millennial capitalism's logic of accumulation by dispossession. Utilizing De Silva's previous work in Towards a Global Idea of Race, they position the subprime crisis as a successive deployment of raciality to deflect culpability from the architects of the global financial crisis. Therefore, subprime debt and debtors highlight a moral position in global capitalism that, quote, refigures old and new mechanisms of writing the racial subaltern as naturally, morally, and intellectually unable to thrive in modern capitalist configurations built by Europeans and their descendants everywhere. Okay, I'm just gonna skip a little bit, so I'm running low on time. <clears throat> I suggest that the historical collisions between scientific race and Philippine political economy in Davao elaborate an intellectual history of debt and moral intellectual indebtedness to capitalist state formations. We can see this in the Bureau's introduction of debt to plantation laborers in Davao. It is evident that the Bureau's role as ethnological survey of the Philippines evolved into a conduit that facilitated capitalist investment, scaffolded by discourses of, civil, of racial uplift to make non-Christians productive citizens in the material development of the islands. However, equally interesting is the Bureau's peculiar role as financial institution per se in its function in debt collections. 
The Bureau not only track agribusiness investment and the progress of civilization, but also track the progress of collections of plantation laborers. After sections detailing the benevolent affect of the Philippine state and U.S. state in solving the moral problem with a new deal, the report elaborates the potential consequences of financial indebtedness of plantation laborers in Sulu, a region that's not fully elaborated in the report, so I'm interested where this agricolonization was happening. One recommendation is salient that despite the economic hardship that many of the laborers in Sulu face, that debts that the laborers accrue to agribusiness firms or to the state should not be canceled, as it would set a bad precedent for the overall civilizational uplift of the South. Although, quote, according to the report the provincial uh, of the provincial secretary treasurer, 17 colonists left Sulu without repaying their loans and seven died. The total indebtedness of these 24 as of the December 31st, 1934 was 13,469 pesos, which should be written off as dead loss. It seems that the subprime critiques now so popular in critical ethnic studies and race theories could widen the historical parameters in their analysis as the progress of civilization in some co colonized societies becomes partly a function of the state's progress in debt collections. I think that De Silva and Chakravarti highlight something crucial by interrogating the subprime discourse. Marginal groups have become con constituted in cultures of debt and indebtedness to global political economy, a culture of debt and indebtedness that extends from 1898 to the plantations of Davao in the 1930s to a feminized migrant labor pool embodied by Juana Change. Debt and indebtedness transform into paradigms of abstraction that cast racial subalterns as effectively outside of modern capitalism, but wholly constitutive of those formations' continued existence. Racialized gender difference then determines the value of bodies to capitalism and your moral and intellectual indebtedness to the state that affects your very dispossession. It is the deployment of racial, gendered, and sexualized difference by state capitalism that shapes my engagement with American scientific discourse represented by figures like Wooster and his Indian scopophilia, to demonstrate how the various epistemologies of race, gender, mental ability, and sexuality have shaped and been shaped by global imperial capital. While De Silva and Chakravarti focus on the modern debt crisis's influence on U.S. and global racial imaginaries, I seek to reframe their theoretical interventions to postulate a productive analysis of Philippine history, U.S. imperial political economy, and settler colonialism. The context of the Philippine state sovereignty anchored in a Filipino Enlightenment discourse to secure the liberal subjectivity of self-determination is particularly crucial in understanding the relevance of economic processes in Mindanao to contemporary racial imaginaries of Filipinos within the Philippines with global political economy and U.S. imperialism. Okay. Wanna Change's critique of the feminization of the migrant labor and histories of Philippine indigenous dispossession and Filipino epistemic sovereignty compel me to examine the historical processes through which scientific raciality is bureaucratized to delineate which Filipinos are the inheritors of the Filipino Enlightenment and which are not. Those that accrue the epistemic and political power to determine the ontology of Filipino itself, written within the teleology of white civilization, and are thus positioned to benefit from the socioeconomic architectures of a settler colonial state. These processes seem to enact the hierarchy of difference in Filipino racial imaginaries, wherein national divisions and intellectual capacities facilitate a capitalist division of labor and global political economy along the lines of anthropological race. Okay, thank you. Should I play this? What we'll do is we'll take a couple questions from oh. each speaker and then have uh, Patrick come in afterwards to either chime in or take on some of the broader discussion. Um, I should also say too that Tony Fulton is uh, one of our PhD candidates in um, But if you want to take just a couple of questions. Sure. Do you guys want to see the video? Is that okay? I'm like afraid to. I'm afraid to make it full screen. I'm like afraid to touch it. Hi. Okay, we'll just do that.
Magbalong ka, ha? Para naman tayo tayo hindi malungkot at saka sa ako ng singkil, eh, ha? Eto pala number ko. Ibibigay ko sa'yo. Kaya ang ballpen, ha? O, ayan, ha? Tawagan mo ko, ha? <laughs> may mga bagong bayan, leche. Hindi ko naman kailangan ng ganyan mga klase ng mga pakuri, ano? Kailangan ko gatong. Eh kung kami ba binibigyan na ng trabaho? Bili ko na kailangan umalis ng bayan. Kaya ang hirap naman nakaasa sila lang sa amin ako. Governor, magmula sa anak ko hanggang sa presidente. Eh, akala ng mga kamag-anak ko bagay ng kudkud ng kubeta. Sa Roma ko nga lang ginagawa pero eva pa rin ano? Eh paano naman? Ipapadala ko ng picture. Siyempre, lagi akong nakangiti. Eh, ano naman mo mapapicture ko nang umiiyak? Wala mo ako. <laughs> Kayod ng kayod, tapos padala ng padala pabalik sa atin. Kaya ikaw ba, ano ba ang trabaho mo, ha? Hindi ka mabukhang Euro General. Hindi ka naman mabukhang member ng Gucci Gang. Ay, baka naman ikaw eh, change citizenship na, ha? O baka ikaw yung maipaparesto ng Senado, ha? We are now approaching Rome. Ay, naku, lalanding na tayo, ha? Basta, nasa inyong number ko, ha? Keep in touch. Alam mo? May kamukha ka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope that was for my presentation, not for the... <laughs> That's okay. Thank you very much, Deirdre, and uh, <clears throat> thank you to Deirdre and Carla for inviting me. Also, thank you to the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, not only to Kate, who, as you can see, has to work hard the whole time, um, uh, but also the Center. I should say that this, uh, this project started out as a project for the Center uh, to try and figure out how to teach American high schoolers about the Philippines in their history courses and uh, how to use the the Worcester photographs to do it, and uh, I got sort of pulled into the vortex that is Dean Worcester. So um, thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'll do that. Um, on July 27, 1900, David Barrows, a young anthropologist of the faculty of the California State Normal School in San Diego, whose doctoral dissertation from the University of Chicago was based on fieldwork among Indian tribes of Northwest Mexico, wrote his mentor, Frederick Starr. In the letter, Barrows outlined a new opportunity that had suddenly presented itself. I have received a tablegram from Judge Taft, he explained, appointing me to a position in the Philippines at a salary of $3,000 a year. I would just note that that's about 81000 in current, so it's a pretty good salary, and transportation. I have cabled acceptance and shall probably leave San Francisco about the 1st of September on government transport. The position comes to me without my applying for anything of the kind. But two months ago, I got a letter from President Wheeler of State University, that would be the University of California, saying that I could expect such an appointment. President Wheeler knew of my desire and purpose of visiting the East for study and travel, and in his letter intimated that there would be large opportunities for research and exploration. I think that my work in anthropology will stand me in good stead. I hope to do something among the native races. Do something among the native races, he certainly would. Following a brief transitional stint as the superintendent of Manila Schools, Barrows was named chief of the newly formed Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes in October 1901 in its first, uh, it has two different points in Philippine history where it comes back, this is the first one. This position placed him under the direct supervision of Dean Worcester, who was the insular government secretary of the interior. Together, the two men created and implemented a new racial organization of the Filipino people. Based on, quote, modern, unquote, scientific racial principles, they developed a schema of the general racial categorization of the archipelago's tribes and ethnic groups that, for the first time, I would argue, defined all native inhabitants of the archipelago in relationship to each other and placed all Filipinos among, along a continuum that ranged, in their view, from complete savagery on one hand to very near full civilization on the other. 
Not only, therefore, did Darrow's do something among the native races, he functionally created a system that defined exactly who these people were and how they were related to each other. In a circular of information written uh, and published in December 1901, two months after his appointment, Barrows described the mission of the new bureau. Its objects, he wrote, are the investigation of the little known pagan and Mohammedan tribes of the archipelago, the conduct of systemic work of, in the anthropology of the Philippines, and the recommendation of legislation on behalf of these uncivilized peoples. From its outset, therefore, Worcester and Barrows conceived the work of the bureau as both academic and practical and was imbued with the duty to uplift the wild peoples who were its responsibility. These dual yet linked foci, a civilizing, civilizing mission combined with and based in scientific knowledge, provided the primary structure to Worcester's conceptualization of the new American racial approach in the Philippines. The promulgation of an American style in 1903, that should be in quotes, which required the creation of racial categories and groupings within which Filipinos could be enumerated <clears throat> occasioned the initial American project concerning race in the Philippines. While the census was formally overseen by the military, its racial structure was developed within the Department of Interior by Worcesters and Barrows. Both men had been selected for their colonial posts based on their academic credentials. Perhaps as a result, they were very careful in several instances to clearly lay out the theoretical bases and the methods of their work and to connect these structures to previous and ongoing scholarship, mostly coming out of European anthropology um, of race. The development of a grid of American colonial racial thought and policy in the Philippines, therefore, is particularly easy to trace, although I'm struck with the lack to which historians have done so formally in their work. The general assumption of the American colonial regime around race was presented in Barrow's Circular of 1901. The racial component of the colonial project was a product of this late 19th century anthropology of race. Um, it was an academic approach in which both Worcester and Barrows were formally trained, and it influenced both the questions they asked of the situation and their initial methodology. The two men saw their work in the islands as a perfect opportunity to define the racial anthropology of the Philippines, to redefine, sorry, or to refine, sorry, and redefine, I suppose. At the time, the field was obsessed with the question of both the origins of races and their pure types. Um, but much of the previous scholarship had been carried out by scholars who had never, in fact, been to the islands. These men based their theories on accounts sent to them by amateur scholars in the islands, or in one case on skeletons that had been illegally purchased in the Philippines and smuggled to Berlin. Of particular concern, because of the needs of the accuracy of the census, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think Americans fetishized accuracy at this time, um, Worcester and Barrows wanted to reconcile the widely varying accounts of the numbers and names of the island's wild tribes. To do so, they proposed to use ethnolinguistics to consolidate differently named groups of people who they thought were in fact one ethnic group. Um, but more importantly for this paper, they also proposed the use of anthropometrics, that is the measuring of human bodies, to distinguish particularly pure examples of racial groups from members of the same community who might exhi exhibit admixtures of other groups as well. And attached to the scientific work was a goal of ascertaining the essential character of each of the island's tribes so that they could be recipients of appropriately designed and targeted colonial policy. The racial scheme Barrows put forth in 1901 not only formed the basic analytical structure of the 1903 census, and here you see maps, graphs, and tables all divided by wild and civilized um, as the basic level of or the basic uh, part of the analysis. Um, it was reconstructed in St. Louis in the 1904 World's Fairs in the division of villages, and Worcester used it himself to arrange his own photographs. Um, additionally, and perhaps of most lasting effect and connected to where Sony is going, uh, the schema was also swallowed almost completely whole, I would argue, by Filipino principalia elites who argued in post-1912 nationalist debates over self-determination that they, and not the Americans, were best situated to affect the uplift of their own backward little brown brothers. And this racial arrangement of the Philippines is therefore worth exploring here a little bit. So Barrows put together a schema based basically on the time of arrival of different racial stocks in the islands. So their argument is that the Negritos are the aborigines, unquestionable the original people, that they are the pure type has woolly and kinky hair and other Negroid characteristics, and they are complete savages, as he said. 
Up the line, <coughs> you have these admixtures. So negritos of mixed race where the hair starts to lose its matted kinky character, becomes frizzy and wavy, they get taller, their skin gets lighter. Um, and importantly, such types are sought to be among the Christianized inhabitants of central Luzon. We believe that they reveal negrito inheritance. And this is going to be an important little, little bit. Above them are Malayans uh, of early arrival. So they become the wild tribes. Um, uh, Apayos, Ifugaos, Yalongots, Kalingas, Italons, uh, Ibilaos, and Gians, among others. And above them are Malaysians of civilized tribes who came later from Malay stock that had already seen the value or the, the, the improvement of, of Malay, uh, of uh, Hinduized um, Southeast Asia. And so in the racial thinking, uh, these people were more susceptible to Christianization when the Spanish arrived because they had already been influenced by a great society. Um, there's another group, and the last arriving group are the Mohammedan Malays, the true Mohammedan Malays, or the Moros in Mindanao. Um, and you can already see in his description some of the things that come up about Mindanao, uh, that um, uh, combining commerce with piracy, they came in their restless prowls to the Sulu Islands and southern Mindanao. Um, so there's already a construction of Muslims as pirates and as, uh, well, outlaws, uh, economically speaking. So what you get in Barrow's racial schema here is something about er, uh, order of arrival, Aborigines to Negrito admixtures, wild early arriving Malays, and then late arriving Malays who are more civilized, uh, both wild, i.e. non-Christian, and civilized, i.e. Christian. And those are not my words. Those are the words out of the, out of the census itself. Um, and the Malays are sort of, the Moros are sort of sitting, floating someplace in the South, not quite connected. Um, but there are some problems here. Uh, first of all, the admixtures are not just between Negritos and wild early arriving Malayans. They're also admixtures into the Christian community. So there's some questions of finally connecting these civilized Filipinos all the way back to more Negrito, Negroid uh, peoples. And there's a question of where do the Moros fit in this and how do we do that? So this is actually solved in 1903 uh, in the census with an amendment to Barrow's racial schema where the, the focus switches from time of arrival to level of civilization. And so the Moros get slipped in above the wild tribes and there is a distinguishing uh, that happens uh, between them and the Christians. So you get wild non-Christian, civilized Christians staying there. And there's also a particular division that's allowed to happen for Tagalogs in particular. And this shows up, you have to read between the lines a little bit, um, but all of the governor gen all the governors who are also the supervisors of the census in their districts are asked to give descriptions of their people clearly responding to a series of, of questions that are, that are common. And they all start to talk about superstition. And none of the Tagalogs are, claim that they're a superstition. One doesn't mention it. Two say we don't have it. Everyone else says we have superstition, except this crazy Visaya from Bohol, who insists that, in fact, superstition has been supplanted by the arrival of Americanism and all, this, uh, all of this stuff. And it's the one place where Sanger, General Sanger, puts a footnote in that says, clearly, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Everyone knows all Visayans are equally superstitious. So the Tagalogs are allowed to claim lack of superstition and no one else is allowed to. So there is a separation that happens. Perhaps it's connection to Jesuits. Uh, I think there's also something that's going on about being close to Manila because the Pampangans say, in spite of our closeness to Manila, we are still superstitious. So there's something going on uh, there about, but the Tagalogs very clearly get separated out. It also happens in 1904. People say that the Tagalogs were the only people not uh, actually exhibited at the fair. I would argue they are exhibited at the fair, but they're exhibited at the fair as, uh, as the people who come as the delegation, the official delegation from the Philippines, rather than living in villages. So again, they're separated out. So this is how this ends up in the 1903 uh, census. Um, sorry, I got ahead. Where's the next place I pick up? So the census only posited various slight variations among the various civilized tribes, with the one notable exception of the Tagalogs. 
Um, but uh, <clears throat> overall, the civilized tribes were dealt collectively with as Filipinos, and there's a uh, elements in which times the non-civilized tribes are also sometimes called Filipinos and sometimes not called Filipinos. But there is the creation in the 1903 census of one, I would argue, one ethnic or one racial Filipino nation, even if there's some distinguishing marks among it. So um, eventually, the census data and its presentation distilled Filipinos into these two essential characters of Christian civilized and non-Christian and wild. Um, again, with the Moros providing the critical analytical pivot for both of those structures. And although arguments about the relative prevalence of one group over another, mostly political but also cultural, would mark the discourse of decolonization, this schema remained essentially in place in future discussions of both who Filipinos were and what the Filipino nation was. So true to their academic selves, Worcester and Barrows designed their research protocols with the very best scientific methods in mind in preparing to study the peoples of the Philippines. And to do this, they proposed to measure Filipino bodies. So in his 1901 circular, um, Barrows went into great detail to explain how with six body measurements, you could actually create two indices. Um, and among, by using those, you could find, you could label people's relative civilizational status. So he would take height and grand ervergeur, and I think this is actually a telling photograph because the only photograph that we have of anyone doing this in the entire collection is of General Pack, of governor of Mountain Province. So it's not, in fact, uh, uh, and I'll talk later about why I think that's important. Um, and there's also a cephalic index of the head and a nasal index of the nose. And I had these open yesterday in the coffee shop, and someone walked up behind me and said, what the F are you doing? And uh, it tells you how, how, how strong these images still are. Um, so the cephalic index basically uh, uh, gives you long-headed, medium-headed, and short-headed peoples, according to the index. Um, the nasal index gives you long, thin noses, medium noses, and flat, wide noses. And Barrows tells his, uh, he's written a series of instructions for potential volunteers who are going to go out and measure people. Um, and he says, this is one of the most significant and important characteristics in physical anthropology. Its results always hold true more nearly than any other. In a general way, all the white races and peoples are leptorinian, that is long noses, uh, thin noses. The yellow or Asiatic, including American Indians, are mesoridian, and the black race, Austral uh, Australian, Melanesian, and Africans are platyridian. Platyridian, sorry. Um, but he starts to fetishize accuracy. He says in these same notes that it, basically, if you can't if you can't, if you don't have the right calipers, then you should jam their head up against a wall and use a square. And then at that same point, you should note in your, in your field notes that these are only approximately accurate, that you couldn't really get the proper and complete things. But this, uh, he's very careful to back this measurement up with thick description. So he gives a full set of, of, uh, of questions that someone could look at to make sure um, that they get a good description of the, of the physical specimen that they're looking at um, as by saying that although physical anthropology can best be pursued only by precise rules and making exact measurements with instruments, yet physical data of much value can be gained by careful observation. Um, and so then he goes into this entire list of things how are the legs, how is the hair, is there color, is there, ba is there baldness on the back of the head, um, etc. Are the breasts droopy or are they, what I should say, I should use his precise words rather than mine. Um, are breasts of women long and pendant or rounded and erect? Um, so he goes through a whole series of things that his volunteers could make note of in trying to get a sense of who, who they were measuring. Um, and there's only a small bit of photography in this 1901 uh, document where he says, from the above data, a very satisfactory description of the physical type can be made. If photographs can be taken, get two bust views, one full face showing both ears, and the other an exact sharp profile of the left side of the head. Um, there's a problem, though. Barrows tries to go out and actually do some measuring himself. And I've only found three sets of actual measurements in all the things that I've looked at, two by Barrows and one in a source I'm going to talk to a little bit. Um, and he goes for two days in October 1901, or for a week in 1901, where he does two days of measurement on Negritos, and he measures 24 people. 
Um, and these are the notes on his first one, uh, a male named Yamot, um, where he takes the six measurements, he figures out the two indices, he has very detailed notes on the scattering of gray hairs, notes on the character of the nose, the eyes, the nature of the limbs and the calf muscles, and the diameter of the ball spot on his head. By the time he gets to number four, just three over, he still has all of this stuff in place, but the notes start to thin out a little bit. Um, the notes on the character of the eyes and the, the nature of the limbs and the calf muscles, but they're thinner in detail than he had for Yamont. By the time he gets to women, because he did the men first, um, he is even less careful about what he does, although I do have to say, in honesty, there are also some women's, uh, the very first woman that he measures looks very much like Yamot. He's very careful again. And then it starts to slip, and he, in the very second woman that he goes, that he measures, almost the whole bottom thing is a little note about that she has psoriasis, as do her children. Um, so a lot of the other details are gone. And by the time she gets to the last person, who's Emilia, who is very old and is the abuela de todos, or everyone's grandmother, uh, he only takes four measurements. And perhaps that's because she's old, and perhaps he added her on to be polite. We don't know. But nonetheless, you definitely get a sense that the quality of this degrades over the course of the day. And as any of us who have done field work know, that's not particularly an unusual thing by the time you get to the end of your last interview. Um, he does at the end of the, he does in the midst of that take time, he does two uh, drawings in here, one of Rufino's nose and one of a woman's uh, scarification on her chest and her belly. Um, and he does take the time to figure out the indices and the average height particularly of the men, uh, and I'd point that out, it's four foot nine and one quarter. I'd like you to remember that number. On the second day, he, he measures five more Negritos. They're slightly taller, um, and you can just see even visually how much less information he gets in the second day on the same process. So my argument is that this, this measurement turns out to be profoundly impractical as a way of trying to do this work. That in the only set of, doc, of, of places where I found it, that there are all sorts of reasons why it can't happen or why it, it ceases to happen. Um, and this is also backed up because Barrows apparently gave up the goal of measuring Filipinos uh, into proper classifications rather quickly. In a report uh, to Worcester on another trip to visit uh, Aeta, as he starts to call them, uh, for the local thing of Negritos, um, Camus a month later, it's clear that Barrows did not intend to measure them because he says, I had neither camera nor instruments with me, but my observation is that the nasal index, which in the pure negritos of Bataan and Pampanga frequently exceeds 100, is in the case of these much lower. So he still is looking at negritos with the same sort of sense of how I want to read their bodies, but he takes neither the camera nor the calipers to get any data. It seems to have been thrown out to me, I would argue. Um, there's an interesting exception to this, and this was a series of photographs that were done um, in Billy Bid Prison in, 18, in 1903 and done specifically to be presented at the World Fair. And this is an album of more than a of, of 80 plates taken from more than 1,000 photographs which were sent to St. Louis. Um, and what this was, was it's the, it's the one place where you see the combination of measurement and photography right up next to, to each other. So you have nine body measurements, um, and this was done uh, by um, a man named Folkmar, who had his, who was a, lived up in Mountain Province, but had his uh, doctorate from the University of Paris. Um, and uh, he uh, added three more measurements. He added uh, weight, he added the chest size, and I forget what the other one was. He still calculated the two index. Um, and he then did a comparison for each prisoner within their ethnic group average and the provincial average. So he's trying to do this uh, in terms of using measurement and photography. And he really is searching systematically for types. So he goes into great detail about how he divided people out. He ranged people up by height. He took out a representative sample. And then they took photos of those people. And then they chose the very best ones to put in here to try and be representative uh, of the type. And uh, um, sort of playing into some what Sony said, if any were manifestly abnormal, they were rejected. Um, uh, 
So it was aimed to select the two of the best for the album, and the men selected were generally nearest to the average of their province. And so this is the one time you would see this. And I would argue this is actually the edge. It's the side of what colonial policy is able to do. It, it can only happen because it's in a prison like Billy Bid. It can only happen under a sort of Foucauldian space, that this is not actually possible in the general running of, of society. Um, but there's still this fetishization of accuracy. So he actually goes, he, he wants to point out that that one camera takes better photos than the other, but nonetheless you can get to within one-eighth of an inch of accuracy at half the scale size. And there's a suggestion that in fact that this album sent to the Americans could sort of be used for, oh, do-it-yourself at home anthropometry. That students could in fact uh, practice on these photographs and see if, how close that they could get to the, the math that he's already created. Um, and he suggests that there's a further project for study, uh, which is rather interesting. It's suggested to those having access to the exhibit of photographs that by their means interesting studies may be carried out further than the author has thus far done. It's believed, for example, that a count of the 612 full-length photographs will corroborate a preliminary count of about 200 men made while measuring them, nine-tenths of whom were circumcised. These were mainly Tagalogs, but the same proportion is believed to hold true for the other Christian peoples. Now, I'm not sure yet why it's important to note that Tagalog men are, are circumcised in large numbers, and I know nothing about the history of Tagalog male penises at the turn of the, of the 20th century, but perhaps this is going to be a new area of research. Um, uh, here's the interesting thing. It disappears. All of this measurement disappears. In the 1903 census, there is only one, one and only one, and I can't tell you how many hours it took to be able to say that, one and only one mentioning of an anthropometric measurement. And it is that Negritos are the males averaging about four foot 10 inches in height while the females are shorter, also tied to Barrow's. So I'm pretty sure that it is in fact Barrow's measurement of those nine Negritos that gives us that. Um, and uh, Barrows had taken photographs, we'll go by that. Uh, you can see again, coming back to Worcester, he used this, in, this same arrangement of people. And you can notice that he also has moved Moros into the swing spot between the wild and the civilized. Um, and so my argument about these, these, uh, these photographs really is that they still need to be seen as scientific documents, that they were conceived of as a way of doing science, that they happened alongside the measurements, and that using Barrows's ideas of thick description and of the questions that he asked his, um, that he asked his volunteers to look at, you can see all of these things in the photographs. So uh, the quotes up top are from his instructions to his, to his uh, volunteers. Notice the character of hair, whether fine, coarse, straight, or growing a little special king, uh, spiral kinks peculiar to the Negro. Photographs of all of that. Whether you have good calves or whether you have adipose flesh on the butt, on the buttocks or not, all in the photographs. Whether the breasts of women are long and pendant or round and erect, all in the photographs. And then it helps to explain some questions like why there are these photographs of the backs of men's heads, which I hadn't really understood. But one of his questions is, does baldness occur? Or are the teeth perfect? And here you have a picture of a woman with her teeth filed. So um, my argument in a longer paper is that this goes on to, to profoundly inform how the Filipino elite uh, understands their own nation, that they use a nationalist argument against the Americans using all this stuff. But when they turn internally and they start to pass their own legislation, they also position themselves at the very top, trying to distance themselves within a national, a national space from these wild peoples. Um, so do something among the native race, Barrows and Worcester most certainly did. Together, they created a whole new vocabulary of racial representation through which the Philippines would come to be understood in racial terms, not only by Americans, but by Filipinos themselves. Maraming salamat.